Hey everyone and welcome back to the Unreal Multiplayer tutorial. In this video we'll pick up from where we were previously. We're now going to add in the player spawning as well as going over a few of the kind of nuances and different approaches you can take when setting up and working with your local multiplayer game. Just a very quick recap as I know that we've started implementing a lot of things in different classes as we're going through getting them ready. So I just wanted to recall where things have been placed and some of the functions we'll be using. So first of all, inside of the input receiver, when the user presses the start button, we're using this function here on the game mode through the interface that we've created to call the spawn player function. We're passing in the player index and a reference to the input receiver so that we have all of that information ready to use a little bit later. Remember that the Interface is just this BPI underscore game mode here, and it's just a function which is taking those inputs and a return value so that this will appear in the game mode. So in the game mode, this is the interface just here. So like I said, it's pretty much acting just like a function. We have our input and our return that we won't be using. But the main thing is that this can be accessed from our input receiver very, very easily. And this is where we'll be placing the bulk of our logic that we do in this video. So in fact, what I'd say is we can close these other classes and if we just start with the game mode, what we'll do now is we'll get our player spawning logic implemented. So this is actually going to be nice and simple. What we'll do is as soon as the input receiver takes the input that the start button has been pressed, we're going to spawn a new actor. So I'm just gonna drag from the execution pin so that this will automatically link up the next node and search for the spawn actor. We want the spawn actor from class and in here, we're just going to place the transform and provide some information. So the class that we want at the moment is going to be the BP underscore player. This is also going to take in an index. So remember, this is going to be relevant for the color swapping thing that I wanted to demonstrate as well. And we'll need a place to spawn this. So we could pull from the input receiver here and look for the transform. That's why we're passing this in is that we have access to all of the information about the receiver. And also remember that when we use our player starts, we're using the player start transforms as the transform for the receiver to be spawned in. So they're all gonna be rotated and looking in the direction of the arrow. In a similar way, whenever we take the input receiver transform, it means our players will also be facing in that direction. So it's a nice, easy way to visualize how we're gonna get the players uh, spawning in and getting them facing in the right direction. So to do this, a quick tip, if you're not familiar with this inside of functions in Blueprints, is we can actually use this input receiver as a, almost a local variable by just searching for input receiver. You'll see down here, we get the option to use the get input receiver. And as long as this is the same spelling, you know that you found the right thing here. So this is just getting the parameter which is being passed in the function signature. So this is essentially what you could do in C++ anyway. And I'm not sure if a lot of people are familiar or aware that you can do this in Blueprint function. So again, this really helps to tidy things up and keep things very kind of clean and readable. Like I said, the other option would be, I've, I've even seen some people come in and they'll do something like promote this to a variable or promote it to a local variable and name this one like local underscore input receiver and then they'll call that one throughout the function. Um, we can just skip all of that and we can just use the get search function here. But with that information for the input receiver, we can drag from here and use the get actor transform and we can just plug that straight into our transform information there. So now our new player is going to be spawned in, like I said, with the location and the rotation that the input receiver had. So they'll all be facing each other when we have all the players. And in a similar way, we want the information for the index. So we can do the same thing again. We'll use the current player index. And we can search for this as well. And again, this is doing the same thing. We're just getting a local version of this here. We can pass that in to the index and just tidy the blueprints a little bit. So nice and simple. We now know where the player should be and which player index they're being given. So this is going to help us in a moment with the player visualization customization part. We also want to possess this. So this is a very important step. So what we want to do is pull from this execution pin again, type possess. Because we're not pulling from the player controller, we won't be able to see that if we don't untick the context sensitivity. So we want the possess option. We want to pass in the pawn that will be possessed to be the one we've just spawned. And then we're gonna get the player controller. So now the player controller is possessing the player we've spawned in. We want to make sure the right controller is controlling the right player. So we'll control W, the player index. 
and hook that into player index zero. By default, it will default to zero, which is going to be the first player. And of course, we want to make sure that as we're going through and creating all of our player slots that we've done previously, and all of those controllers are getting spawned in, we want to make sure the correct one is hooked up to control the correct player. With that done, that's pretty much it. Also note that because we're now possessing this new BP underscore player, that does mean the input receiver that we had is no longer receiving input. So we don't need to worry about the start button being pressed and spawning in new players, at least not for the index that we now have a player for. So of course, if we spawn in player one first, that means that we can still spawn in two, three, and four uh, because they will still be possessing the input receivers just in case people were wondering why suddenly the input receivers weren't doing anything and why we don't need to worry about tidying those up, deleting them or anything like that. So the next thing we're going to do, if we go into the BP underscore player class, I wanted to go through uh, the demonstration topic that I covered where we created some kind of visualization between the different players. So at the moment, if we press play and get all of these spawning in, they're all going to be the same orange color because that's the default visualization. So just a very quick example of how I set mine up on the begin play. All I've really done is I've got a reference to the mesh and I'm gonna set the material. And in the material, what I'm going to do is hook this straight up to the begin play, pull from the material slot just here and use a select node. This is going to allow me to select from an integer, which we'll use as the index. And I want two more of these, so four, one for each of the different players we can spawn in. And I think I had orange as the first player, blue potentially as the second, uh, green as the third, and then I think red as the fourth player. So what this is going to do is it will find out what index has been assigned to the player and then choose the material to use on this mesh when that has been uh, checked. Now the reason I've done it this way, you could come in and assign hex values. So rather than, because these are material instances, rather than having a material instance for each of the options, you could come in and set the vector parameter and choose a color. The only reason I haven't done that is if I ever wanted to change anything, if I didn't like the shade of a color or something, uh, this means I can very easily come back to my assets, go to the materials and just very quickly come in and say, I didn't like the red, I could come in and swap out the color or the shade of the red that I'm using. In comparison, if we did this through the values inside of the set vector parameter here, that means you'd need to remember to come into the player class, find the specific node that you wanted to change and change all of the colors in here. So I think visually it's not adding a whole lot of extra assets to the, the project. Uh, and visually this is just easier to work with. With that done, I'm just going to press play and we'll see if we can start spawning some players in. So I'll click into the window and press enter. So this is my first player, uh, which is orange, which is correct. And then I'm actually using another controller now, and this is also controlling the first player. So that's a topic for just in a second. With the second controller, if I press start, then I'm getting the blue character. And like I've mentioned, if I had extra controllers at this point, then I could demonstrate the third and fourth character. Now the reason at the moment, uh, this is again, this is me moving with the keyboard for player one, and this is me moving with the gamepad for player one. So this is going to be the next topic is seeing how we can separate these out so that the keyboard can be a specific player and the first controller can also be a specific player. The other thing to note as well is that we're still getting the split screen, so we're having four screens spawned and this is automatic because we're spawning in the four pawns, uh, the receivers, which are a type of pawn, so they all get their own viewport, even if we don't have a player in there. So some people have already said that they want to proceed on a kind of split screen basis, which means you can pretty much leave things as they are, especially if you have characters like mine, which have the camera already assigned. That means each different screen or portion of the screen will have their own camera so you're pretty much good to go but in this section now i'm just going to go through how we can remove the split screen and also remove the link between the keyboard and the first gamepad so to do this we need to be in the project settings if we deal with the split screen first of all we can just type split screen or even split and this is very simple we just need to untick use split screen what will then happen is if we press play we can see player one is here and gets the whole screen and player two is going to spawn in over here on the same screen. This is going to lead into another topic in the playlist where we look at uh, single shared cameras, uh, but that is a topic for the future. Back in the project settings, we now want to unhook the first player being controlled by the keyboard and the gamepad. The way we can do this, I always forget this, uh, what this is called, but I think it is called uh, skipping something. So we'll just type skip. 
and we can see here, there we go, skip assigning gamepad to player one. If we tick that, that means that the keyboard will now always be player one. The first gamepad will be player two, the second gamepad will be player three, and so on. So this means actually for my testing purposes, I can now test three different players. And there we go. So with the same number of controllers, I've now got the keyboard, which is the only thing which controls the uh, first player. My second gamepad is controlling the third player. And my first gamepad is controlling the second blue player over here. Again, if I had another controller spare, then I could also spawn in the fourth uh, red player. But I think we can get the idea that this is working. So that is fine again. So that is exactly what I wanted to see there. One caveat here is that if you wanted the first gamepad to control the first player or have some control over that, there isn't actually a simple fix in Unreal to do this. Uh, unfortunately, you will need to dive into the C side of things, into player controllers and the binding setup. Uh, it's something we've had to do before in commercial projects that I've worked on or alongside. So that is something to be aware of is unfortunately that is a little bit of a restriction. This is at a quick setup. This is the most that you can kind of separate things and get control of all of your controllers back uh, without diving into C++ at least. And I think with all of that done, that is pretty much everything we set out to do in this video. So what you could do if you were following along again with the split screen is you can now turn this back on and we can see that will have quite a nice demonstration here where each camera or each character will have their own camera. So we can see things specifically from each player's viewport, which is quite nice. Uh, like I said, rather than having, at the moment it's going to default if I don't have this, which is the way I'm going to proceed on the playlist, is that it will default even if you spawn in, let's say, I think player two, first of all, and even player three, it's gonna to default to player zero's camera just because of the way that things are kind of defaulted to on the index. It's always gonna look for the player camera zero as the starting point, unless you override that. What we're gonna do is we're going to kind of obfuscate that into a shared camera anyway so that you're always going to be looking through this shared camera and then as everyone spawns in that will take into account the distances and movement between the characters. And that's something I should probably mention is that the playlist so far has got some really good feedback. It seems to be a very popular topic which I wasn't quite expecting for the local multiplayer stuff. Uh, it's something that I really enjoy making. I prefer making local multiplayer games to networked but I wasn't sure how popular it would be so it's something I wanted to cover anyway. Because of the feedback it's getting I'm going to make this a little bit longer than I'd intended uh, and one of the first things I'm going to cover is we're going to segue, we're going to rework some of the player setup that we have and I'm going to show you how to provide a kind of lobby where we can choose, each player can choose which character they want to be. So we're going to break down the characters a little bit, we'll probably change the BP player into four different player characters that you can have. That way each person who drops into the game can choose their own character. We can then follow this through to the next set where this will then, rather than defaulting to spawn in BP underscore player, it will remember what the individual user has chosen and spawn that in as the controllable player. So a few people have already asked for this feature to maybe be included in the playlist and then I had a request on Patreon. So as a kind of Patreon reward there I'm going to cover that topic first of all and that seems to be something that has a lot of interest anyway. And then once we have this new player system included I'm going to go back into the shared screen camera. So we're then going to cover that. Having that kind of dynamic camera which will follow the players around and change its uh, field of view or whatever, depending on the distance between all of the characters to try and keep them in the screen. I think at that point, that will probably be the local multiplayer stuff done. And then I'll move on to the networked replicated multiplayer topics. Uh, but of course, in the meantime, if there's anything else you wanted to see, anything that I haven't considered for the local multiplayer stuff, then do leave some comments in the uh, sections down below. Like I've done with this, if I think I can fit it in quite naturally without making too many changes to the existing setup, I'll definitely consider adding that as a new topic before wrapping up the local multiplayer stuff. So with all of that said though, that is everything for this video. As always, if you enjoy the video or find it useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps the channel to grow and to reach and help as many people as possible. And of course, as ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.